Hey there, it's Kimberly from Keep the Tail Wagging, and I'm really excited about today's video, which is with Dr. Lori Kozier, a holistic veterinarian out of New York, who also breeds raw reared Australian Shepherds. She is a wealth of information. I've known her for years. She's helped me on blog posts. She's taught me a lot about raw feeding, dog nutrition, reading ingredients, um, everything. You wouldn't believe. I've even consulted with her, you know, just got her advice on a few things with my own dogs, and I trust her implicitly. Today, we are going to be talking about vegan and vegetarian diets for dogs. So, can a dog um, thrive off of a diet that does not have muscle meat, offal, liver, and bone? Is that possible? Is there a time when a dog may only need to eat a plant-based diet? And, um, if that's the case, when would this happen? And why is it that someone would consider feeding their dog a plant-based diet? So um, Lori and I got together early this morning, early for me, and hashed it all out. And I hope it's something that will help you as well. Thanks for watching. Okay. Hey guys, it's Kimberly from Keep the Tail Wagging and I'm here with Dr. Lori Koger. It's Koger, right? Koger, actually. Koger. Doctor, I always, I don't know. We just talk online all the time. Exactly. <laughs> Dr. Lori Kozier, and we are here to talk to you guys today about vegan and vegetarian diets for dogs. So recently I um, received a series of messages from someone who identifies as a vegan who felt that I was doing my readers and my group members a disservice by not allowing discussions on vegan and vegetarian diets. And the reason why I don't is because um, I believe that dogs are carnivores, and I don't feel that on a regular basis, it's a healthy diet. I'm sure that there is an exception to the rule, but um, I figure instead of me talking to you guys about it, I would talk to a veterinarian. So, hi, doctor. Hey, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so, um, tell me, are dogs carnivores or are they omnivores? Actually, I prefer the term facultative omnivore. Um, they can get some nutrition from vegetables and I certainly, as a raw feeder of many, many years, feed some vegetables and fruits, but they are designed to eat meat and in my world they are required to eat meat. So, so, so in fact, yeah, go ahead. Racing sled dogs and such, um, where a friend of mine was working with it at Cornell, uh, they get 40 to 65 percent of their calories from fat. That's, that's animal fat. Yeah. And that's when those endurance dogs are at their optimal. Yeah. So, and, and I just, there's no way a dog can be vegan, sadly. That's just really Let's interesting. Let's just put it out there. Yeah. <laughs> that's really yeah. interesting about the um, sledding dogs. Cause so they're kind of like on a keto diet almost. Almost. Yeah. Well, the other thing is, as you know, fat is so much denser in calories than proteins or the carbohydrates that dogs don't require at all. Mm -hmm. These dogs have to eat a huge amount of food to run for 12 hours. Yeah. They'd have to eat twice as much protein or carbs to get the same number of calories, roughly. Yeah. So that, along with the way it's metabolized, is more efficient for size of stomach. And someone once told me that um, vegetables, because they break down the carbs, are a better source of energy than protein. Is that true? <sighs> you could say that. Protein is really meant to be... Um, a structural part of the body, you know, like think of young animals, they're putting on muscle, they're building body structures. Protein is ideal for that. Mm -hmm. Carbs more for breaking down to sugar, fats for going more the keto pathway. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm more and more on board with a more keto oriented diet that's moderate in protein and higher in fat than I used to feed. Yeah. And then um, I know I'm going over my questions that I have. Sure. You know, I, the one thing that comes up and it's like whenever, this isn't the first time someone has um, asked me about this. I, you know, I get blog comments. I um, get, you know, people who join the group. And um, one thing that I always tell them is just like, you know, a vegan diet is just not a species appropriate diet. It is for a rabbit, um, not for a dog. So I wanted to ask what exactly is species appropriate? Well, for me, um, the first thing is the moisture content in the physical form. Dogs are not designed to eat dry things. They're designed to eat moist flesh, which is 40 to 55% moisture, depending. 
Um, it would contain a lower amount of carbs. You know, think of that wolf or coyote, the ultimate carnivore in our world. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of carbs in their diet. There's not a lot of vegetable matter, but there is some. And then the rest is protein and fat and some bones for the mineral. Yeah. Um, that's, that's essentially a prey model diet and for most people. Is species appropriate the same as biologically appropriate? Hmm. I guess I would equate those two terms. I always did. Um, so it's in like my, you know, in my world, yeah. When we see a kibble brand trademark the term biologically appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll go there. We'll go there. <laughs> it's not um, quite. <laughs> and, and actually, there's an organization called the Pet Nutrition Alliance. Have you heard of them? No. Um, they're an organization of organizations and sponsored, of course, by Hills and Purina. And they put out veterinary advice to, or nutrition advice to the veterinary world. Um, their board of directors and their, their, all nutritionists and industry representatives. But the first line of their feeding instructions contains the phrase species appropriate food. And it's like, and then you go violate it with everything <laughs> else that you put in and recommend. Yeah. Um, like, um, what is it? Dried bakery products? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> if I recall, dried bakery products were a part of cattle feed when I was at Cornell as an undergraduate in my nutrition courses. I mean, that is moldy bread. Let's just call it what it yeah. is. And they can, you can process anything. There's an excellent video, it's probably still available, where they take an old boot and some motor oil and a few other things that are not food, cook them up and run an AFCO analysis on it and it analyzes just fine as dog food. Yeah. And it's incredible, you know. I, I feed food, I don't feed chemicals if I can help it. Yeah. And so, um, I know that, you know, the argument that I get from people is that, you know, well, if I have a dog that's allergic to every protein known to man, you know, what am I supposed to do? And I always, my first question to these people are, are you feeding a raw diet? Because when um, Rodrigo was like that, he seemed to be allergic to everything, but I was feeding him kibble. So I can never find a kibble that, you know, it would work for a month or two, and then all of a sudden he would backslide. But when I switched him to raw, all of a sudden I found that proteins that he couldn't eat on a kibble diet, he could do a lot better on a raw diet. And then to go even further, it really depends on the sourcing. So um, he usually can't eat, he can't eat chicken, turkey, um, lamb, or beef. Those are his triggers. But once I found a really good source for green beef tripe, he does great on beef. Once I found a really good source of lamb, he does really good on lamb. I, he still is wonky on turkey and chicken, but you know he has quail and pheasant and duck, so I'm not worried about it. So um, I don't understand the jump from my dog can't eat any of these proteins kibble to now I'm going to feed vegan. So I mean, is there like a situation in which raw just isn't going to work and a dog is left with nothing else, but, or I should say a vegetarian diet? I, I've never run into that. Um, my first question would be, how are you determining your dog, is, what your dog is allergic to? Mm -hmm. And is it a true allergy or is it a hypersensitivity? And Jean Dodds has some great content in her book about the differences between those two terms. Um, and we know kibble can never be pure. Even if they wanted it to be guaranteed pure to the list of ingredients, they're making this thing in ton batches yeah. in big machinery that's impossible to clean from the previous food. Right. So, you know, the dog who is truly allergic, just a contaminant level is going to set them off. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is what else is in there and what processing. We think it's allergic, the dog is allergic to say chicken but really it's allergic to the processing of the chicken. Yeah. So a lot of these dogs I'll take to a raw or a cooked diet and they'll do a lot better and they'll tolerate proteins that they may have even tested allergic to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the other thing of course is the purity. You know, as you said, when you get a good source, it's not contaminated with something else. Your dog does fine. Yeah. So what, you know, I've heard, you know, there's the saliva test, there's a hair test. I mean, which would you recommend if someone wants to have their dog tested? 
what I've generally I've generally used the blood test from VARL, which is Veterinary Allergy Research Laboratory in California. I've also used Dr. Dodd's NutriScan. I think there are merits to both. Um, I had a Rhodesian Ridgeback that was eating a premium kibble that supposedly was, um, I think it was venison and something. Um, and this dog was a train wreck with skin. So we ran the blood allergy test from Varl and the dog tested, uh, I think a five or a six, which is the scale goes from zero to six mm. as a soy allergy. So the guy brings me the food bag in and we go through all the ingredients and there's no soy listed on the label. We're like, we're fine. So he feeds it, dog still a train wreck. I called someone who used to work for that particular company and she said, was there lecithin listed on the label? That's all derived from soy. And it was within the top five ingredients. Took the dog off that and put it on real food. Amazing, amazing recovery. So that blood test worked very well in that memorable case. Right. Um, and I've had others, you know, that'll test it a three for a couple things. And allergies can be cumulative. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you've got three allergies going and you're feeding all three of those three things, your dog's going to be a mess. Yeah. So for me, having control of the diet ingredients is, is really, really important. Yeah. Is what I find is that um, with Rodrigo, um, he does really good, surprisingly, on answers food, which is fermented. Mm -hmm. so I feel like it's changed the structure of it. Um, someone also told me, um, like, the reason why he can do green beef tripe, and actually, it's not pure tripe, it's tripe mixed with trachea and gullet, mm -hmm. is because sure. of the different parts of the cow that just aren't triggering him. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just so complicated. If you start thinking about it, it's like, I try not to overthink things. I just go with it. It's like, okay, he's doing well on it. That goes on the good list. And you treat him as an individual. And yes. You, know, you try things and not all dogs read the textbook. Yeah. So you have to look at the individual dog and say, this is a good or this is not so good for him. Yeah. Yeah. And, but yeah, there's a farm that I'm so bummed because we, my co-op sources a lot of food from this farm mm -hmm. and my other dogs do great on their food. Rodrigo does not. And I'm just like, why? I went to the vet and I'm like, why? It's so affordable. And yeah. it's grass fed, grass finished. The animals are treated great. It's in a beautiful area. And um, my vet was like, well, have you gone out there? And I was like, no. He was like, like if it's in a huge field near other farms and the other farms are using pesticides and they're blowing over to this field and i was just like good lord are you kidding me sadly we live in a contaminated world yeah and it's just like one of those things where it's just never going to going back to you know your statement about treating them like the individual he's just because of his history with antibiotics he's so sensitive to so many different things that I honestly am no longer surprised when I bring a protein in the house and he doesn't do well on it. Um, right now he's trying a cooked food um, that someone sent to me and he's doing well on that as a food topper. Mm -hmm. And I'm not surprised because I cook stuff for him and he does well. But yeah. um, and that's the other thing. I can cook chicken for him. I can cook turkey for him. Yeah. I can cook beef for him and he does fine. But it's raw or the kibble, which is like, I don't even know what he's reacting to in a bag of kibble. So there's yeah. something in your process of cooking that, uh, you know, interferes with the response. Yeah. It's, and it, but he can't do it for a long term. It's like mm -hmm. he, he can do it for a few meals, maybe a week. And then, but he wouldn't be able to do it on a long term basis. Eventually, it's like what you said earlier, the cumulative where over time it builds up and then it's like, oh, okay, never mind. We're not going to feed this anymore. Well, and think of the kibble dogs that eat the same thing every day, mm -hmm. year in, year out, because the owner believes the statement on the bag, oh, don't change the food, because right. the dog will get a GI upset. So what are the long-term, you know, for people who are feeding their dogs a vegan or vegetarian diet, what are the long-term side effects of something like that? Um, number one thing I would think of would be cancer. Um, Premature aging, cardiomyopathy from taurine and carnitine deficiency, diabetes. Um, I, when, you, when you sent me these questions, I looked around to see what commercial vegan vegetarian diets are out there. And I looked at three. Um, 
Natural Balance has one. There's some a place called V Dog and Halo has one. Yes. They were all over 50% carbs. Oh wow. Natural Balance came in at 58 by my quick math. Now that's 58% sugar. There's no way a dog is going to be healthy on that. I mean, they'll survive for a while. Mm -hmm. And I see this with the dogs that are fed like, you know, the junk foods, the old Roy's or Alpo's or Beneful's of the world. You know, at age one and two, they look great. By three or four, they're starting to look a little iffy. By six years old, they look like they're 12 years old. And it's just the, the dog can take the insult, the... Um, Karen calls it nutritional abuse mm-hmm. for so long. And the owner looks at me, I say, you know, you really should change it. they like, he looks fine. Look at his beautiful coat. It's like, yeah, but down the road, you're going to hate yourself. Yeah. Um, I, but I was blown away by the starch content. Yeah. And it's like, cause there are vets and that's the other thing is there is a group of vets who are now proposing a vegan or vegetarian diet. And I mean, they're doing it because of how animals are treated Mm -hmm. in the food system, which I understand and which is why I am trending towards a vegetarian diet for myself. But that's, I would think, would be more of a push to support local farms rather than saying we're not going to feed meat, period. And and I think that that causes confusion to um, a lot of people because here it's like, well, this doctor says it's okay. Yeah. You know, I think most people who choose a vegan or a vegetarian lifestyle are doing it for ethical reasons and reasons that, um, you know, are good. And, you know, for us, we can do it. Yeah. For dogs and cats, that's not their biology. And, you know, we're, it's funny, I work with an exotics vet who is very traditional, but he treats reptiles and amphibians. Now he doesn't recommend giving them snake chow. (laughs) They go and get, you know, little fingerling mice and all the things that reptiles, I mean, sometimes he comes in with his 30 pound snake. It's like, get me out of (laughs) here. Oh my God. Um, Or, or a a guana that's three feet long and not counting the tail. It's just amazing. But they get a species appropriate diet. So why as a veterinarian, a trained scientist, do you say, hey, that creature needs a species appropriate diet, but the dog and cat don't? Yeah. How do we, how do, how did we turn off our brains yeah. to not consider each animal an individual? Yeah. And it's, it's funny because it's, you know, seven years ago, Rodrigo and Sydney are seven and a half years old now. And I got them Memorial Day weekend, mm-hmm. seven years ago. And back then I knew to go to the store, you got the best quality kibble is guy has to be on the top shelf because that's what it meant and meat had to be the first ingredient mm-hmm. and that's as far as I went I got something that had some form of nature in the name of it and um, it had a chicken on the label and it cracks me up because I rarely go to um, the big box pet stores anymore but whenever I find myself in one I'll go and try and find the food that I fed my dog and just laugh because the ingredients are, you know, like, oh, I would never feed that food to my dog or recommend it today. But back then, I thought I was doing a really great thing until mm-hmm. Rodrigo exploded all over the yard. Yeah. And, and, but it was just like, you know, it never, ever, ever occurred to me that, um, that that wasn't right. And I had a veterinarian, never, even he, like, he treated um, food intolerances with antibiotics. And I remember the first time I took my dog to a holistic vet, I was blown away. I was just like, I wanted to marry the man because all of a sudden he was like pointing to things and saying, well, this is because you're feeding this and it's an inflammatory and it's causing this. And I was just like, what? It was so eye opening. And and it's frustrating to me when I see people going back to the vegan diets. It's frustrating to me when I see people who are so unwilling to even consider like you know like I it's one of those where I respect where you're coming from yes absolutely. and and I respect that you went on YouTube and found some videos with vegan recipes and that's your support but it's just sort of like are you serious it's just 
I, I honestly cannot get my head around like where are they where are they getting the um you know the calcium for their bones ah good point what the other thing i noticed when i was looking up these these vegan diets because i wasn't really familiar with them because i would never recommend them um a lot of synthetic and minerals from china mm -hmm. you, know, you have to you have to get those that calcium in there somewhere yeah and i wouldn't i try i'm trying not to use commercial or synthetic vitamins minerals you know whatever they add to balance the food most of it comes from China, some from India, which isn't a lot better. Right. So great, you're vegan, but now you're introducing things that most vegans and vegetarians would not be okay with going in themselves. Yeah. Probably they don't realize it, but it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And it's just, it's one of those things where while it's, it's giving me a, a little bit of a respect for traditional veterinarians who are super anti-raw, I read recently, I'm, I'm looking for, I heard a rumor that um, Consumer Reports is putting out a study against raw. I haven't seen anything oh, yet, sure. yeah. but, um, but I know that they did write something a few years ago and in their article, it said, you wouldn't eat raw meat, so why would you feed it to your dogs? And it's like, because it's species appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> it's not species appropriate for me. But, um, you know, I, but it does give me, a little like that that mindset of you know seven years ago if someone would have told me that this is what i would be doing i don't think i would be like no but i would be like huh is that okay because i had the what about bacteria and all of those things but i feel this way about the vegan diets where when someone comes to me with this i'm just like i actually someone recently asked um what if i she has a puppy and what if i wanted to feed my puppy a vegan or vegetarian diet and it was so hard for me to remain polite because it was just like i was so offended by the idea of harming a puppy and i just explained you know it's not species appropriate there's no way you know where are you and i just asked where are you going to get the calcium what about the protein how are you going to give them enough protein without also giving them too much, you know, starch, you know, the carbs and, and the sugars and, you know, and, and the essential fats that only come from animal tissue. Exactly. And it's just sort of like, yeah, you know, people, they can have, you know, plant fats and I'm like, but it's not the same, you know, coconut oil doesn't have omega-3 fatty acids. So, you know, it's just one of those things, but people truly, truly just don't know, you know, they don't understand how important these things are. I didn't even a year ago, or mm -hmm. I should say two, three years ago, I thought coconut oil was an alternative to fish oil. Many people do, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's just like, this is, we're not taught this. There's no class for the average dog owner to go to, to learn how to feed their dogs a species appropriate diet. So, well, that's- That's why you wrote the book. I know. <laughs> and that's why you have a, um, a, you know, I want to talk real quickly about you have, well, it's far away and we'll have to t do this again closer, mm -hmm. but in April, 2018, you have a, um, um, a pet expo ish type event coming up. Tell us yeah. about that. So the healthy dog expo is in April, April 7th of next year in Albany, New York. Um, I've got a panel of amazing speakers. I've got the one and only Susan Thixton yeah. from Truth About Pet Food and uh, Jessica Sleater, who is the attorney for the pugs that were harmed by the Avengers. Oh, food. wow. Yeah. So they're going to kind of co-present and talk about, you know, safety in pet foods, what to do if you think your pet has been harmed by a pet product, mm -hmm. um, as well as Susan. Susan just likes to do a lot of questions so that people get the information they need. Yeah. Um, and then I've got Dr. Judy Morgan to compliment them to also talk about foods. Yes. She's, she's a piece of work. Yes. She's, bringing, she's bringing the RV, the yes. husband, maybe the son, and all the Cavaliers. Yes. <laughs> um, so it's going to be great. Um, I've got Dr. Debbie Gross Taraka, who's the world's foremost canine rehabilitation specialist from Wizard of Paws. She's going to be talking about non surgical approaches to taking care of cruciate injuries which I think a lot of people, I'm, I'm seeing a cruciate injury. I, when I was in vet school, we would see one or two a month. Mm -hmm. And that's at Cornell. I'll see one or two a week now in private practice. It is incredible. Why is that? I, to me, it's diet and vaccines. 
um, you know, chronic starch excess, chronic inflammation. Um, some people feel manganese is a tipping point. Mm -hmm. And over vaccination, where these dogs again are constantly placed in a inflamed state, they're eating so much starch, they're getting chubby, and they're young dogs that are having a great time playing ball. Yeah, and that ligament goes. Yeah, and that's now around here a thirty-five hundred dollar fix <sighs> for a TPLO on a you know say a, a a Labrador. Yeah. And something like 80% of labs that have blown one cruciate will blow the other. Yeah, I've heard and that. Now we're talking about $7,000. Yeah. And, you know, the intense management post-op and everything. So obviously a lot of people are interested in a non-surgical approach. Mm -hmm. And Deb is the queen of that. Nice. Nice. Oh, yeah. That's going to be amazing. Yeah. And I've got Suzanne Clothier too. Do you know her? I've heard of her. She has, she has a New York Times bestseller, Bones Would Rain From The Sky. She's a behaviorist trainer, German shepherd breeder, um, very, very interesting person to give some mental and behavior type perspective to balance the health topics. Yeah. Um, I've got the folks from Answers coming to exhibit Yay. and talk. Billy's coming. <laughs> um, I have uh, the farmer's dog mm -hmm. and I have Honest Kitchen. Um, some other local vendors, custom collars and such, um, a dog training uh, place, center, um, a cannabis biscuit. Oh my God, they sent me nine boxes, <laughs> eight ounce samples of these cannabis biscuits. Um, I've got um, the Mellow Mutt, which is a catnip for dogs. Oh, yeah, I've heard. All these, and of course, essential oil and Pure Haven. Um, all these natural things, and these people will be in the exhibit hall to talk with all day. Nice. And I'm adding more. I have one more for you when we're done. Oh, good. Don't let me forget. Yeah. Um, I know I'm constantly thinking about you because I'm just like, oh, we should know about this one. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But um, I think that um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you before we signed off was when it comes to raw feeding, because this is something that, you know, my audience are people who are brand new to raw. Mm -hmm. And um, they've been, or they've been feeding raw for a couple years. But I always say that we never stop learning. And I was wondering, like, what are some of the mistakes you're seeing people make when feeding raw, besides overthinking it? Overthinking it. I'm glad you mentioned that first because it's always amazing me. I had a at a great consult on uh, Thursday with a woman with a golden doodle who's going to be her service dog. She has some mobility issues. And he's had chronic GI things. Um, a week before he had received rabies, lepto, and distemper parvo all at once. Oh, wow. Which I'm surprised he didn't react very unfavorably to that. But she went from, I'm not sure I can do this, to where can I get elk and emu? <laughs> <laughs> and it's like they go from, I'm just starting out to, oh my God, I'm doing it you know, internationally. Yeah. So overthinking it either in... I, I must feed all these exotic things or I must measure to the milligram. Yeah. Yeah. Um, most common mistake, I'll mention raw diet to a client and I'll see them the next time and they'll say, oh, I'm feeding raw. I got some chicken breast and some ground beef and a little bit of rice. <laughs> well, you missed one thing there for sure. Um, that's very common. Um, I'll have other people who want to, who they aren't willing to feed bones and they don't put the calcium in in some other way. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think your point about we're always learning yeah. is definitely has been hitting home with me lately. Um, I started out like 25 years ago with Volhard diet. Are you familiar with Volhard? No. Oh, Wendy Volhard, uh, the holistic guide to a healthy dog a pioneer and she actually formulated this diet and had it tested which oh, I do know who that is in the 70s with she worked with yeah. Dr. Carrie Brown yeah but in the morning you fed your cereal meal so you had to get buckwheat and millet and all this and in the evening you had um your meat and your supplements that complemented that like bone meal and it was quite a process it, it was a lot of grains mm -hmm. so you know I fed oatmeal I fed millet I fed buckwheat um the apple cider vinegar was key and you had to measure out your vitamin C and such, but it was 
to their testing balanced. Now, then, you know, as we evolved, got rid of the grains, um, I fed from sources that I later found out were not so good. Mm -hmm. um, I fed bone meal for a long time before I went to feeding bones. Mm -hmm. um, I've used commercial mix based mixes like you did yeah. um, for a while and then went to making my own. Um, I fed too much chicken and not enough variety. Um, I think, you know, it's cheap, it's easy, it's available. Yeah. I think people do make the mistake of not feeding enough variety, not feeding enough fish. Yeah. You know, and not feeding enough red meat. Yeah. That's what I keep hearing about is the red meat is that we're not, and just trying to understand what is red meat. And it's, it's funny because those are the things that shape my blog post because I'm constantly asking those questions myself. It's like, mm -hmm. of course we know um, venison, elk, uh, I have emu here and um, alpaca and um, beef, but um, you know, there's the proteins, it's, it's the birds that throw me off. Yeah. Because, you know, I know duck and, you know, turkey and chicken, but it's like, I'm always looking up like, well, pheasant, is that white meat or red meat or quail? Mm -hmm. Is that white meat or red meat? Sure. And you, sure. you look it up, you'll find sites that are like, nope, all birds are white meat. And then other sites are like, no, these birds are white meat, but these ones are red meat. And it's just like, oh, my head. Have you ever um, had a wild turkey, goose or duck? No. Much, um, much darker meat, much less fat. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Totally and, different. And I think the, um, the, cause the, the turkey that I have access to, um, is, you know, isn't wild, but it's just sort of like whenever, like for instance, cause I've always wondered if Rodrigo would do fine if I got chicken from like a local farmer. Mm -hmm. that just like, Hey, I'm butchering my chickens and right. if you would do better on that than commercially purchased chicken. And it's one of those things where maybe one day I'll, I'll figure that out. I still, I want to try, I went to the pet store a month ago to go, cause I was going to buy answers, chicken answers, beef sure. answers. I know he does good on their pork and I was going to see if he did good on the um, beef and the chicken, but my pet store doesn't carry their food. They only carry their goat's milk and fermented fish stock. So today I'm going to a different pet store and I'm biased and it's just going to be my little experiment and then a blog post. And yeah, absolutely. And I think I want to ask one more question, which has nothing to do with vegan diets, but it's something that came up in the group because now I have you and this is taking advantage of this and gosh, what was it? I'm, I'm losing. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. oh yes. Grain fed. This is the thing is, you know, this still comes up over and over again. You know, thank you, Dana Cook and Dogs Naturally Magazine for dropping this one into our laps of balancing fats. And, you know, this came up again in my group last night and of people, because I asked the question about how much, how much, you know, fish do you feed? And, you know, what are you, the dosage that you're doing? And one person said that, well, when she feeds beef, she does this. And when she feeds chicken, she does this. And I'm like, uh-oh, balancing fats. Yeah, balancing and, fats. And I was told, and again, we're all just learning from each other. And I walked away from all of that discussion earlier this year with the thought that if we are um, feeding a variety of proteins, worrying about balance, that, you know, balancing fats is no longer a worry because we're doing it naturally by feeding variety. But someone made a really good point of if that variety is mostly grain fed, we should be balancing fats. And I want your take on that. I that's an interesting point, and I think that has merit, um, or at least you need to know what the differences are between species X, grass-fed mm -hmm. or grain-fed. Yeah. Um, unless you're getting your cows from um, the, direct from the farmer, your beef yeah. from the farmer, most of those may be pasture-fed initially, but then they're grain-fed at the yeah. feedlot. So I, I guess I would have to look at the numbers, but again, I'm a balance over time person. Yeah. So the tweaks I make lately are, you know, fish three times a week more. I used to do once a week. Um, beef in, I do my own grinds. So more beef in there to balance out the chicken. Mm -hmm. um, and topping off beef, because um, that's what I have access to right now as my chief red meat. Um, on top of the mix if I need to. If it looks if it looks a little pale. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm hopefully have someone who will be raising a lamb for me. 
Mm -hmm. So then I'll just essentially buy a sheep for the dogs and just mm -hmm. have it, have it ground. Right. Um, I used to use one of a, a commercial lamb mix, but then they started changing how they were making it and sourcing it. And it became, you know, wholesale six bucks a pound. Yes. <laughs> you know, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I feed four dogs. Yeah. It's so expensive here. I I'm lucky when I can get lamb. So, well, that was it. So thank you so much for being here to talk to me this morning. Sure. Anytime. And I am going to shut off the recording and then I have uh, something for you. The source. Great. And there you go. So I want to say thank you to Dr. Lori Kozier for taking the time to meet with me this morning and explain all things um, dog nutrition and vegetarian and vegan diets for dogs. It's really a hot topic. I know in the, um, the pet loving community. I know that people want to be able to do their best for dogs to respect the fact that in America, at least, we do have a problem with how animals are treated in our food system and people want to address that and people don't want to support that. Um, my way of not supporting that is to slowly transition myself to a vegetarian diet. I'm at the pescatarian stage right now. Um, it's getting easier, but this has not been hard. It's been, um, years in the making and I'm learning as I go along just as I'm learning about my dogs. But the key takeaway from my discussion with Dr. Kozier is simply that, you know, dogs do need a diet of muscle meat, bone, offal, and liver. That is a species appropriate diet for dogs, not a plant-based diet. It's hard to um, obtain a balanced a uh, nutritious diet when you feed a plant-based diet without also adding synthetic ingredients that are going to make it diet, make sure that your dogs are getting the vitamins, the minerals that they need to be healthy and sustainable. And while I say that, I'm gonna also say that we are always learning and there's always new information coming and we're always evolving. So um, I am open to other experiences, other points of view, because this is such a hot topic, I want to remind people that when you do share these opinions with me and other people in our community, do so politely and respectfully. You know, when we disagree and we become to a point where we're calling each other's names and we're attacking each other, I, I shut down. I don't want to hear it anymore, simply because there are so many wonderful, nice people out there sharing information. I'd rather learn from them than learn from someone that's going to call me names. So let's all um, make a point of when we're dealing with these hot topic issues, be sensitive to each other, be kind to each other, because ultimately we're all here for the same reason. We want our dogs to live longer, healthier lives. And to do that, we need each other because we're learning from each other. So thank you so much for taking the time today to watch the video and I wish you all the best.